Hello there, and welcome back to my 8-bit computer. So today, as I promised in previous videos, we're going to have a look at the RAM, which is, in fact, these two breadboards minus the instruction register, which we won't talk about today. Um, and as you can see, the computer at, at this moment is turned off. Uh, because uh, one of the first things I want to show you is uh, how we actually enter a program, such as this simple program, which I wrote, into the RAM. Now, as you remember, uh, we have program memory and data memory, and so we need to get this program, or to be more precise, the machine code corresponding to this program into program memory. And so I wanted to show you how that works. So let me just power on the computer. So uh, the clock at the moment is in manual mode, so it isn't advancing, but uh, we, we could advance it, you know, manually. But uh, at the moment, program memory contains uh, complete rubbish, so we really have no idea what would be executing. And so uh, if we want to uh, enter contents into program memory, we have a, a switch here. Let me move the camera just a millimeter so you can see it. Here it is. So I've called that the prog switch so I can just flip that over until so you can see a light here which is showing me that at the moment I am in RAM programming mode and so one of the first things to notice is that in programming mode I can only access program memory so in contrast to Ben's computer uh, my computer doesn't allow me to program the data memory in any way the only way to change the contents of data memory is to write a program that does so uh, one thing is it reduces complexity, and on the other hand, it, it encourages good programming because you, you really need to uh, control all of your data through your program. That's the whole point. So uh, whenever you turn the program mode on, the, the, this program switch on, no matter what memory uh, the, the CPU was addressing before, in program mode, you are always accessing program memory. And we'll have a look later in this video uh, how I've set that up. Okay. And so, uh, just as in Ben's computer, we, we have two DIP switches, one here to set the memory address and one here to set the memory contents. And if I set a memory address, well, it shows up here immediately. So the, the action of that switch is immediately. So now I'm going to set at address 7. This is address 6. Uh, this is address 16. And we can see we have a bad contact here. Uh, that's address 17 uh, and so forth. Um, and so the biggest difference is that I can address uh, 8 bits of memory, which gives me a total addressable space of 256 bytes, but always inside program memory. So okay, let's go ahead and just uh, enter this program. So over here we have the addresses, which are simply sequentially numbering from 0 up to 9. So we actually we have a 10-byte program. And here are the program machine language uh, sequences, bytes, basically, which I should enter into program memory, which should hopefully correspond to my assembly program right here. So let's just do that. So I'm uh, at address zero right now, which is very good. So I need to enter the uh, program code at address zero, which is zero, 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 one, and then four times one. All right. So of course, this doesn't change immediately. I need to signal the computer somehow that I want this byte to go into program memory. And what I've done on my computer is I've, uh, using a technique we'll, we'll have a look at later, I've actually hooked that up to the clock. So I don't have a separate um, memory program button. Um, I simply press the clock here, the manual clock, and that will clock in this value into address zero of program memory. There we go. And so I can do the same for bit one, byte, memory byte one, at address one. So I ought to have zero in there at the moment there's garbage, so let me turn all of these switches to zero and pulse the clock. And there we have the second byte at address one. Now let's go to address two, enter the byte we want in there, which is 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. All right, go to byte three, which is 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Go to byte 4, 
And so that should be 11000011. One, one, zero, 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 one, one. And we go to byte 5, which should be 00111001. Zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, zero. Set that. Almost done. Byte 6, which is four zeros. And then 1001. Byte 7, which is 0010, and then all 1s. Byte 8, which is in fact the decimal value 2. So we have a problem here. Uh, my dip switch. And then the ninth byte is 0010. Zero, one, one, zero, one, and once again, so this switch has a has a bad contact in it. This this second bit, or bit one of my address. So uh, one day I might have to go back and have a look at that. So anyway, let's get that byte in. All right, and now let's check again if we got everything right. So byte byte zero. There we go, should be uh, 0001, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, that's fine. Byte 1 is all zeros. Byte 2 is 0100, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. That's fine. Byte 3 is 1001, 1011. 1, 1, 1. That looks good. Byte 4. Oh, I'm a bit fiddly here. Byte 4 is 1101. 1, 1, 1. That's good. Byte 5, 0011. Oh, sorry, I'm checking. Byte 5, byte 6. That looks good. Byte 7. All right. And then byte 8. That looks good. And the final byte 9. That looks good too. So, that's basically how we enter a program into program memory, into specific bytes. Now, uh, I say here that this is the memory address register, that isn't entirely true. So uh, if I switch back to normal run mode, you'll see the memory address register contains a totally different value. And this is what's actually in the memory address register. So as we'll see in a little bit, when I'm manipulating these dip, sw dip switches, I am manipulati manipulating the memory address, but it's not the value from the register, it's, it's the value from the dip switches. And that's what you can see here. So these dip switches at the moment don't correspond to that address at all, because obviously when the computer is running, uh, it's going to determine which address it, it wants memory to point to uh, in order to do a read or a write operation. So now that that program's in memory, let's uh, have a look what it does. Uh, so to get it started, uh, we're going to have to reset the computer, because as you can see at the moment, the program counter uh, is pointing at some address over here in, in high memory. And of course, we want it to start at address zero. And so I have a reset switch, which does that. And there we are, program counter is at zero. And so the program is going to start running. And uh, immediately, this is going to involve memory operations. Um, I don't know how clear it is uh, with the LEDs bleeding, but um, the, the control logic is basically telling the computer that he should take what's in the program counter, which is zero, since we just reset it, uh, and output that into the memory address register. So uh, the, the control logic is, is going to set this to zero on the, next clock, on the next clock pulse. So let's have a look at that. And there it is. It's been set to zero. And so the next cycle uh, is telling, the, uh, is also involving some memory operations. And those are, uh, first of all, I want to access program memory. And so indeed, the RAM has been configured to access program memory. And this signal is telling the RAM that he should enable the contents of whatever the memory address register is pointing to, which is zero, out onto the bus. So that ought to be our first instruction. And of course it is. So that's very good. And that value should now be out on the bus. And the reason it's out on the bus is because the, the control logic is actually going to store it in here, in the instruction register. And then it's going to interpret that and to figure out what it wants to do. And so we'll get to how the control logic works in a later episode. Uh, 
but we can sort of now just just believe that it, it works correctly and so what it what it's actually going to do is store a value of zero into register d so this is initializing now as it happens when i turn my computer on d was already zero but as we discussed in the last episode uh, we really shouldn't count on that so it's good practice to always reset whatever uh, registers you wish to depend on uh, during the startup routine of your program. So let's just uh, cycle through that. So uh, uh, he's going to load that into the instruction register. Okay, that's been done. And so now the program memory is off again. As you can see, control logic is no longer telling RAM to access program memory. So at the moment, what I'm seeing is actually the byte which is stored at address zero in data memory. And so as you can see, that, that is completely undefined. So in fact, that is 128 plus 32, uh, that's uh, 160 is the value that's in there right now. Uh, but that is, of course, uh, pure coincidence. Now, uh, if we want to put a zero, if, if you have a very close look at, at this program here, so, so this zero that we want to write into the D register, it's what we call an immediate operand. So the, the value zero is actually embedded in the code. If you look at that second byte here, that's all zeros. And the reason that that's all zeros is because that, that's the value that we want to write into the D register. And so physically, that zero at the moment is located in program memory at address one. And so for the control logic to know what value he should write into the D register, He's going to have to have another look at the contents of program memory. And so if you look, that is exactly what he's doing. Um, the program counter, which has been advanced to 1, um, is, is going to get written into the memory address register a second time. So the memory address register is, is going to be instructed to point at this byte in program memory, which, which contains that value which we want to write to the D register. So OK, let's advance the clock, and indeed, there's now a 1 in the memory address register. And more than that, the control logic is telling the memory that we want to access program memory. And so the program memory light has come on again. And so now we can see the contents of byte 1 of program memory. And of course, that is 0 because that's the way we programmed it. All right, so, and the control logic now is telling memory that it should output that 0 onto the bus, which it's done. And it, that's then going to be written into the D register using uh, the, the right control logic, which we looked at in the last video. So let him just do that. And that's the end of that instruction. And so now we get to the next one, which is, so we've, we've, this instruction was actually two bytes long. And of course, the, the control logic has done what it takes to, to, to deal with that. So the program counter at the moment is pointing at address two binary uh, zero 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 one zero. That's address two, which is this, and that, so that should be this next instruction. All right, so let's get that started. So the beginning, beginning is the same. The program counter, which is now two, is going to be uh, output onto the bus, and there it is. And so that two is going into the memory address register, so that we can go and get the second byte, or byte number two, which is actually the third byte from program memory. All right, so let him do that. Memory address register has been updated. This, the control logic is instructing the memory to look at program memory. So that is happening. And we can see the contents of program memory address 2 are in fact 01000011. And that makes sense because that's what we programmed into there. And so that is being output onto the bus. So this memory module. Uh, is outputting its contents onto the bus, and there they are, 01000011. And once again, that's going into the instruction register. And there it is, and so that allows the control logic to figure out what it wants to do next. And of course, I chose my program here specifically to involve a lot of RAM operations, because RAM is what we're interested in in this episode. And so this instruction is, is what it means is load into register A, which is this register, the contents of RAM at address whatever's in the D register. So this, and this instruction is using the D register as an address register, and I can do that. I can use any of my registers as an address register. And so this zero, uh, that should be an address that should go into the memory address register, and then I should have a look what's at that address 
of course, data memory this time, because this is loading data, uh, that should go into the A register. Now, at the moment, we're looking at address 2. So the first thing that the control logic is going to have to do is to uh, get this zero value out of the D register and into the memory address register. And so if we have a look, indeed, the, the register D is enabled, so, so the contents of that D are actually being output onto the bus, and there they are. It's a zero, and that's going into the memory address register. So that should go back to zero on the next clock tick. And there it is. And so now... Uh, the control logic is telling memory to output the contents of RAM at address 0, but not in the program memory. And so we're not accessing program memory right now, we're accessing data memory. And so that's that random byte. And so this program, if you have a look at, look at it further, what that's doing is reading out all of these random bytes and writing them to RA here. So the idea of this program is to, for us just to have a look at that random data, and we, we get it displayed up here. So if my math is right, uh, then uh, we should have that value, which, which I think is 160, which should show up there. So let's go on, and there it is. So that was what was a byte zero, byte zero of memory when we turned it on. So it's totally random data right now. But okay, that's fine. So we finished with that load instruction. The, the value that was in RAM is, is now in the A register, and so we can carry on. And so we get to instruction three. So if the program counter is counted correctly, and yes, it has, uh, we should have a value of three now that should get put into the memory address register. There it is. And now again, we're looking at program memory. And so that should contain the instruction that we put at address three. And yes, it does. All right. So we should output that onto the bus. There it is. And into the instruction register. And there it is. So what is that instruction? That is the opposite of load. This is a store instruction. So what that's going to do is it's going to take the contents of register D, which is this zero, and it's going to store it into data memory at the address pointed to by D. So, okay, this, this is probably uh, a, a bit of a trivial example, but so the idea is I'm going to overwrite that 160, which was in RAM, with some value which I know, which is the address. So, so when this program finishes, we should have overwritten all the random data in RAM, and we should end up with, with a, a whole sequence of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, etc., depending on the address. Uh, and so that, that's what this program does, basically. Very simple program. So let's just have a look at that. So here's that 0. So that 0 should be output onto the bus. There it is. And uh, the memory address register should now point to that address, because that, that's the first thing the instruction does, is, is to point the memory at the right address. So, so this should become a 0 on the next clock tick, and there it is. <clears throat> and so the last part of that instruction is now to get to, to write the contents, which in this case it's also the D register, but that could just have easily been some different register. So that D is once again output onto the bus, but this time it's not going into the memory address register, it's actually going into memory, because we have a memory write uh, instruction here. Uh, and so what should happen is on the next clock tick, that RAM should change to zero. And yes, it does. And so now that 160, which was in there, that random data has gone. We've overwritten it with the value zero. So the next time, if we were to start this program again, uh, we'd get a zero up here. But let's just, just let it continue for a little bit. Um, now the next instruction, I won't go into too much detail. That's just going to increase the value of one. So, so let me step through that very quickly because uh, uh, that uses the uh, ALU, and we're not really interested in that for this episode. So we come to the next instruction, which is a jump carry, and the idea of that is, so I'm, I'm going to loop in my program, I'm going to loop through all of the addresses up to 255, and when I get to the next one, uh, I want it to just halt. And so once again, uh, this is going to use the ALU, and so we're not very interested in that, so I'm just going to advance through that. And then the last instruction is a jump back to the beginning, so we can go and have a look at the next address, which is 1. And once again, that's just a jump, which is not really the subject of this episode. So, uh, it's not quite done yet, sorry. Now it's done. There we are. And so now our program counter is back at 2. So we're back at the top of the loop. 
And okay, so the next uh, instruction, once again, we're going to read from RAM what the value is. And so we should find some other value. I don't think we've looked at data memory address one yet, but so let's uh, try that out. So once again, the first thing we do, we get that address, which is the instruction address, into the memory address register uh, and tell it to have a look in program memory at the contents of byte number two. And so that should be this load instruction, uh, 0100 0011, and there it is, out on the bus, and it's going to go into the instruction register. There it is. And so what that should now do is, first of all, go and look for an address in the D register, which we've set to one now, and that one should go into the memory address register so that we can read the value that's in there. So, okay, there it is. Very good. So now we see the value that is at address one in data memory, because once again, we're not accessing program memory now. We're actually reading the data part of the RAM. And so that, again, is some completely random value, and that's going to get written. Uh, it's going to come out of the RAM, there it is, onto the bus, and it's going to get written into the A register. So, okay, that happens to have been 73. Very good. And so the next instruction is going to be this store again. And so we're going to take that one. So first of all, we're going to get the instruction. So we're going to point the memory at 3 in the program memory, get the instruction, and then we're going to point the memory back at whatever's in D, and that's 1. So that memory address register is going to flip back to 1. And so now we're having a look at data memory. And so that's that value 73 which we had. But this time we're executing a store instruction, so we're not going to read from RAM, we're actually going to write to it. And we're going to write from the D register. So on the bus we have this 1, which is what was in the D register. And that's now going to go into RAM, into data memory, at address 1. And so there we have it. Now there's a 1 there. And so then again, we're going to increase the D register. So now that's a 2. And then we're going to uh, determine that we shouldn't jump because uh, we haven't read all the addresses yet. And then we're going to jump back to the beginning of the loop. And there we are. And so, uh, okay, let's go through quickly through the next uh, uh, cycle. So then we, we should uh, start reading address 2. So, uh, all right, get the instruction. There it is. Point the memory address at value 2. There it is. And so that's the value, uh, the random value that was in there. And we're going to put that out to the A. So that was 96. And then in the next instruction, we're going to overwrite that with 2. So for, once again, we're going to put that 2 in the memory address register, and then we're going to write to memory that value 2. Here it is. All right. So that program seems to be working pretty fine. So we can switch over to uh, automatic mode and have it run for a bit. And we can see exactly what address we're dealing with in this D register. So that's going to count up and up and up. So uh, we can speed it up a bit. So OK, that was a value 62. And then byte number 4 in RAM, we'll assume that happens to have contained the value 214. And of course, we're overwriting RAM with the values from the D register, but we're never outputting them to the A, so we're not going to see them on the digital display. But we will, if, if we let this program run all the way to the end, so let's just move up the clock, so it runs a bit more quickly. There we go, and so at 2.55, when it reaches that address, it should halt. Almost there. And we're seeing the random values, and that's it, we've halted. So now we're cycled back to address zero, and so we've written some code in there to halt the program. All right, that's great, but so let's uh, move back to manual mode. And if I reset the program, We'll reset the program counter and start from zero again. But of course, I'm not resetting any of the registers or any of the data, as, as we discussed in the last episode. That, that's up to our programs to take care of that. And so our program has actually, by running once, has, has already set the RAM now to some known value. So each data memory address should contain the value of its own address. So byte zero should contain zero, and byte one should contain one. So if we let this program run again, we should see the sequence of values 1 to 255 appear up here. So let's just try that. So let's reset the program counter and let him run, and there we go. So those are the values that we wrote in there. And so on this second run of the program, 
we're getting totally predictable values. So that basically shows us all of the operations of the RAM. So we've used it to store instructions by moving into program mode. Um, we can read instructions, obviously. We've, we're doing that every single time we start a new one. And we can read and write data because we've been using these load and these store instructions. And so that is the function of the RAM. It's, uh, once again, when you understand the higher principles, it, it is not as, as complicated as it might seem uh, on, on, let's say, a first approach. And so uh, in, in the rest of this video, we're going to have a look at how um, I've organized this RAM module to be able to provide me these features. So let's start by taking a, a look at the memory address register. So as I explained before, these LEDs here at the moment, they're showing the memory address, which we're currently pointing to. And so in, in normal running mode, in which we're running right now, and while programs are running, uh, that is coming from the memory address register. And in fact, the memory address register is, is, is this chip here. Uh, and that's 74HCT377, uh, which if you remember from the last episode, is just a, an 8-bit register. Um, and so it, it, we're able to enable it, and we can read in data from, uh, in this case, the bus, and then we can latch it whenever the enable signal tells it to do so, and whenever we get a rising clock edge. And so that's exactly what that chip does. And so you'll see uh, the blue wires here uh, on both the top and the bottom. The pinouts are a bit strange on that chip. Uh, but so the, the input data wires, these are the, the most significant bits coming from the bus, and these are the least significant bits coming from the bus. And so whenever the enable signal is on, which is this yellow signal here, uh, when the control logic tells the memory address register to point somewhere else, so to, to store a new value in the memory address register, well then this chip will simply latch the value. And that value will be in there and it, it will be output on these green wires and then indirectly that they will be sent to the RAM chip. But of course we also want to be able to switch the RAM into programming mode so that we can set the address that we're interested in with the step switch. And so when we do that, uh, then whatever's in this register is not going to be used and, and we'll be using the value on the dip switches. So uh, to illustrate that more clearly, I can actually attach some LEDs here uh, to the output pins of the ad uh, memory address register. And uh, I'm only going to hook up, let me see here, That's the right one. I'm only going to hook up the, the least significant bits because because we're pointing at address 9 anyway. Uh, so let me just do the last two. There's those. And then the last one is up here. And so as you can see, uh, right now, this register contains the value 9. If we were to look up at these, we would find all zeros. And so that's exactly what the memory address register is pointing at. But so if I switch to program mode, if, if you look at these dip switches, they're, they're actually indicating a value of zero right now. So then my, my let's say, control logic, which, which is talking to the actual RAM chip, is outputting an address zero to the RAM chip. But the register still contains the value nine, as you can see here. And so the way we do that, uh, if I quickly look at, at a schematic here for the memory address, uh, take those LEDs out. There we are. And so the way we do that is, is basically we have the register chip here. And so its values are going into two. Uh, 74, in my case, HCT157s, uh, and those are selectors. And so they're going to allow me to select between A or B inputs, and so the A inputs are being connected to this register, or B inputs, and the B inputs are, are, are connected to these dip switches. And so depending on a selector signal, and the selector signal is this one, we're going to choose one or the other input. And so the selector signal, which you can follow all the way up here, is, is, is basically 
just connected to this switch, which, which is the, the program switch that we use to program the RAM. And so um, yeah, we're basically using exactly the same so the same setup as, as Ben Eater uses, except that since we're using eight RAM address bits, we actually have two selectors hooked up to the same selector signal. And that selector signal comes directly from the program uh, toggle switch. So, all right, we're able to set addresses, so I, I can, you know, move this to some other value. Um, but, okay, that's a bad example, because that's exactly 9, but I could move it to some totally different value. And so if I move back to program mode, well then, I am no longer looking at these dip switches. Uh, these selectors instead are going to select the A inputs, which are the outputs of my memory address register and that's going into there and is going into the address lines of the memory chip. Now whether or not we're accessing program mode, uh, which is shown on this LED here, uh, that of course is slightly more complicated because uh, if you'll remember the control logic while the program is running is going to be accessing both program memory and data memory and that simply depends on where it is in the instruction and which instruction it's executing. But as I said in the beginning, when we're in, in actual programming mode, when we, we flip our programming switch, well then we want to be permanently in program mode. We, we don't want uh, any kind of other interference, so we want to make absolutely certain that we only ever uh, write into program memory in that mode. So to do that, we use uh, a little bit more combinational logic. So uh, up here, we have our, our program switch, so that one's determining uh, which address the selectors use, whether it uses the dip switches or whether it uses the contents of the memory address register. But of course that same signal uh, can be used, uh, this is one input, together with the signal coming from the control logic, which we call PGM here, which is access program memory. And so those two signals, uh, we'll have a look at, at the bottom of the schematic, they're simply being ORed together. So if we are using, if we've flipped the programming switch, then we'll always be accessing program memory because then at least one of these inputs will be one. And the other input, which is coming from the control logic, is, is irrelevant at that time. But if we haven't toggled the, the programming mode switch, well then one of those inputs will be zero. And so then we'll actually be uh, taking the, the signal from the control logic into consideration. So this is just basically an OR gate, and that is going up to the top address line, in fact, up here. Uh, and so that's how that works. Now, the actual RAM chip which we're using uh, to store the contents of both the program and the data memory um, is this one. It's uh, called AS6C6264. So that's uh, a 64 kilobit or an 8 kilobyte RAM chip. Uh, it's still a uh, static RAM, so we don't need to refresh it or anything like that, and it's based on CMOS. Uh, so it's uh, pretty simple to use in a circuit, uh, but it is uh, substantially different from, from the RAM technology that Ben Eater uses in his computer. So uh, we're going to have a look at that now. And so first of all, uh, we have an 8 kilobit uh, 8 kilobyte RAM, uh, so that's substantially larger, so obviously we have an awful lot more address lines. We, In fact, we have uh, up to seven address lines here, uh, and then we have another, we have an eighth address line, and a ninth address line, and a tenth address line, and an eleventh address line, and a twelfth address line. So uh, actually we have 13 address lines, uh, which is correct if you want to address 8 kilobytes of RAM. 8K is uh, 2 to the power of 13. Uh, and okay, so that's great, uh, but um, uh, actually an, a difference which has even more implications is we have these DQ mixed pins here. So we have eight of those, one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, and those are both input and output pins, and so their function depends uh, on the situation uh, that the chip is in at any particular moment. And so that's very different from... Uh, Benita's computer because his inputs and outputs uh, are all nicely separated and in fact they were on our registers as well so this is the first time we're gonna have to deal with pins uh, 
which could either be in, uh, in input or in output mode. So to understand that correctly, we can have a look at uh, this the, the truth table, which they provide us here in the datasheet. And so we can see this chip has two chip enable signals, and one of them needs to be high, is an active low, and the other one is an active high. Uh, so this is the active high, this is the active low. Uh, no, excuse me, this is the active low, because when it's on high, then the chip is in standby. And if this one is low, then the chip is in standby. So these need to be low and high respectively before anything at all happens. So let's suppose they are. Uh, and then we have this uh, output enable here. And so if we enable output, if we don't enable output here, then if we keep that high, because that's an active low, well, then our, our, our pins here are, are, are not going to be active at all, especially if we're not writing either. So then, then those basically are going to be not connection. But if we set our output enable to low, well, then the pins are going to become output pins. If we maintain the right signal high at the same time. So if we're reading but not writing, then our pins become output pins. Well, that sort of makes sense. But the interesting part is here. So if we set write enable low, then it doesn't matter what the output enable is. So this signal, in a way, takes precedence. So as soon as write enable is low, the pins will turn into input mode. And so it doesn't depend on what the output enable is. So what we can do, and what in fact I've done, is we could permanently tie the output enable low and then simply control what we're doing using the write enable pin. So if that's high, and that means uh, we're not interested in writing, well then our, our DQ pins are going to be in output mode, and so they're going to show an output. But as soon as we bring write enable, where is write enable? Here it is, low, well then these pins are going to become input pins. And it doesn't matter what happens to output enable at that time. So we can leave that low permanently. But of course, that only works on this particular chip because that's the way this particular chip behaves. Uh, and in some of the later episodes, we'll, we'll have a look at the EEPROMs which we're using and they don't behave that way at all. And some other SRAM chip which you might be using might not behave that way either. So everything that we're going to talk about today really is specific to, to, to this behavior of my RAM chip. So here's the relevant part of the schematic to understand how we've actually hooked up the RAM chip itself, the AS6C6264. So we have all the address lines, and the address lines, they're basically coming from this uh, address arbitration logic, uh, which we had a look at a few minutes ago. So we're coming either from dip switches or from the register. So that part, that part is easy. So those are the address lines O up to 7. Then address lines 8, 9, 10, and 11, they're all tied to ground. And address line 12, as you'll remember, comes, comes from this OR gate, because we want that to be active if either we're in programming mode or if the control logic is telling us to use the program memory. So the address lines are, are pretty clear. We don't really need to, need to worry about this anymore. And so as we just discussed, we're going to tie the output enable signal permanently to ground. Uh, and so, on this chip, the result of that is going to be that these pins will generally be in output mode, so they'll be outputting whatever's in this RAM address, except on occasions when we bring the write enable signal low. And when we do that, well then these pins will be expecting an input value. And we have these two chip enables, so one of them is active low, so we've tied that one low, and the other one is active high, so we've tied that one high. Don't ask me why they did it that way, they just did. Uh, and so the, the important signal in this case is going to be this, this write enable. So the write enable, uh, which indirectly, uh, we'll, we'll have a look at that in a minute, uh, is, is going to signal all of my RAM control logic here that I want to, at this point, write a byte into RAM. Now, supposing we're not doing that, supposing we're outputting, well, then I have my, my signals here, and, and what I have here are two buffer chips. So these are two instances of the 74HCT245. 
and they've been specifically configured in opposite directions. So this one has its direction at 5 volts. Um, and so this particular one is going to pass signals from B to A. And it's going to do that whenever its enable signal is on. And its enable signal, you can't see that here, is actually connected to our RAM enable. So what does that mean? That means that if, if we weren't writing to RAM, if all we were doing is reading from it, well, we'd, we'd have our values out here permanently because we've, we've tied that one to, to ground. So we're always outputting. And so we'd be outputting the contents. We can actually see the contents on these LEDs because they're directly hooked up to these eight wires. And we'd be outputting them down to the bottom here whenever our memory enable signal uh, would be sent from the control logic. And so if we have a look further here, these wires actually go straight out to the bus. So the reading part is, is very similar to the registers. So we're just using a buffer configured to send data in this direction. But then we have the second one. So this second buffer, uh, in essence, is configured in the opposite direction. So this one is going to send its data from, not really the bus, but for the moment, let's think that it's the bus onto these DQ signals for the RAM chip. But it's only ever going to do that when its enable signal is high, and it enable, its enable signal is the exact same write enable signal on the RAM chip. So basically what we're doing is we're, we're having a RAM chip which is in, in def its default behavior is to output its contents on its DQ wires. And those will sometimes be sent back to the bus, depending on our memory enable signal, and sometimes they won't, but, but they'll always be basically on these DQ wires, and they'll always be showing up on the LEDs. Except in situations where we bring low the write enable signal, and that will do two things. That will, first of all, set this RAM chip to write data, and at the same time, at exactly the same time, because, because it's electrically connected to the same signal, it's going to allow this buffer to send data out from, it's not really the bus, but for the moment, for, for our brains, let's think it's the bus, out onto these DQ signals. And so from, from the, the perspective of the RAM chip, they're going to become input signals, which is exactly what we want with this write enable signal. And so that's the way I've hooked this up, is, is by basically synchronizing the writing operation into the RAM and the output from that buffer onto the DQ lines. And so while we're in that writing state, these LEDs aren't actually showing RAM contents. They're going to be showing whatever value I'm writing in RAM at that instant. But as we'll see in a little bit, we, we, we obviously want to make sure that that, that write is, is pretty short. And that it's not an electrical uh, requirement, but it's just good practice to make sure that, that we write into RAM at very controlled moments. Uh, in particular, we want to do that on the rising edge of the clock. And as you'll see, this RAM chip, this is not synchronous RAM, so we don't have a clock input here. All we have is this write enable. So what we, what we ideally want to do is to very shortly pulse write enable low, which will do two things. It, it will open this buffer so that those lines will be connected to whatever it's inputting, and at the same time, input into the RAM chip. And so we need to make that, the, let's say, the minimum length that's required to, to get that done. Um, all right, so uh, let's assume that, that we can do that, that, that in some way we're able to produce these short, low pulses. Uh, the next item of interest is, is to know what data we're actually writing into RAM. So I've, I've been saying for a while now that it's not really the bus, and, and, and that's correct, because if you follow the wires, once again, they're coming from two 74HCT157, so those are selected chips. And this is exactly the same setup that we had for the memory address register. So we have a selector signal here, uh, which is connected to our programming switch. So if that is on, then this selector isn't actually going to select the bus, but it's going to select whatever's on the dip switches. But if that's open, if we're in normal running mode, well, then these selectors are going to select the inputs which come from the bus. So in that sense, then it is the bus, but it, it's sort of an indirect bus. It goes through there, through the selectors, and then into this buffer. But unless we're writing, that buffer isn't going to do anything, so it's going to leave those 
completely alone. And, and that's a good thing because these are going to be asserted by the RAM chip because it'll be outputting. And so that's how we're able to switch these DQ lines from being input or output lines by using two buffers, one configured for each possible direction. And so the last thing to do, maybe, is uh, to have a look at how we've managed some of these control signals. So, so this one's pretty easy. This, this signal goes straight to the HCT, uh, the 74 HCT 377 for the memory address register. So that, that's the enable signal for that address register. So, so that's easy. The program memory, well, we had a look at. So that basically controls uh, indirectly through this OR gate what this, this, tw this bit 12 on the RAM address is going to do. And so if either that signal is set or if we've closed that switch then we'll be accessing program memory and otherwise we'll be accessing data memory because then so, so we're basically using this one bit to select which memory we want. Uh, and the memory enable signal, we had a look at that, so all that really does is to enable this buffer. And so the contents of RAM at that point will be output onto the bus. And so that leaves us with the memory write and the clock. And so the memory write and the clock, uh, if, if you remember uh, in, in Ben Eater's episode concerning memories, he does actually have exactly the same situation. And so what we want is to, to build some sort of an edge detector on the clock signal. And so let's forget these two for the moment. So here is our edge detector. It's a, a capacitor and a resistance in series. And so we're, we're, this is going to detect a rising edge, which we're feeding into this NAND gate. And we're also feeding into that NAND gate something which is a little bit more complicated. So it's either the, the, the memory write signal or, once again, it's this program signal because, of course, the memory write signal, when we're in programming mode, it, it could be anything. Um, it, it depends where the CPU is at that, at that moment. And, and we want, obviously, a clock pulse when we're in programming mode to always input into RAM, no matter what the memory write signal says. So just as for the, for the program memory uh, code, we, we have a little bit of logic here, which is going to uh, determine uh, which is basically going to set the, the actual enable, which we're ending together with this rising clock edge, depending on whether our memory write is set or whether our program switch is closed. And because these are NAND gates, and because this is an active high signal, but this is an active low signal, because we close the switch, it becomes a 1, we need to invert it first. And so we get the opposite here, that goes into there. We get our um, uh, positive clock pulse, on this input, and so that one, since it's being NANDed as well, that should give us low pulses, which go straight into this buffer and into the RAM chip. Now the last, um, let's say, mysterious part possibly, still about uh, our control, little micro control logic for the RAM module here, um, are these two inverters. Uh, and so as you can see, we're not actually taking the clock signal directly and applying uh, uh, an edge detector on it. We're inverting it twice. In the, what we do when we invert a signal twice is we get obviously the same signal on the output. But we are actually buffering it. So if, if we have some sort of electrical instability or fluctuations or whatever, whatever it is on this wire, well, theoretically, depending on, on how well we buffered things, it, it shouldn't influence this side. Uh, it, it's sort of a, a one-way reproduction of the signal here. And if you look uh, on, on YouTube uh, at some uh, a video series by David Courtney, which he started posting uh, around May 2017, and, and I'll post some uh, links uh, in my description to his videos, he describes a phenomenon where he basically hooks up this edge director, edge detector directly to the clock next signal, which actually is also what Benito does in his design. Uh, and it gives him problems because th this capacitor and this resistor, th those are passive components, uh, 
they're actually influencing what's happening on on other components which, which are connected to this clock signal. And of course, not only in the RAM module, but, but all of the modules, because they're all basically electrically connected to, to that same signal. And uh, uh, his biggest problem was in fact with the program counter, which was counting uh, irregularly. And so uh, I, I looked at that. He in, Eventually he finds a solution. And, and in fact, the solution basically is, is buffering. Um, and so uh, I had actually already seen that video before I started working on my RAM module and remembering that, well, I sort of from day one uh, had built in this feature where, where I buffer the clock signal before I try and apply any edge detection on that. And, and by doing so, I've, I've had none of the issues that he describes with the program counter. Of course, I never tried it without these buffers because um, I'm pretty sure I would have had the same issue. And, and uh, the, the reasoning behind uh, what's happening makes perfect sense. So, so I would certainly recommend doing that course you can use a simple buffer uh, some chips provide a buffer uh, functionality I simply used this inverter because if you'll remember from the clock module we had a whole chip full of inverters and we're only using about half of them and so actually I'm using that this bit of circuitry on, on my computer is located uh, right up on the clock module so that basically concludes our tour of the of my RAM module uh, so it's got two main parts. There's the, the memory address register or, or dip switches here, which uh, tell the RAM chip which address we're interested in. And, and we, we extend that by basically having two RAMs controlled by a single address line, which, is, which allows us to switch between program memory and data memory. And then on the other hand, we have the actual RAM contents, which we can see here. Uh, and so those can be output onto the bus when the, an appropriate control signal is provided or the contents of the bus can be written into the RAM chip um, whenever that control signal is set. And in addition we have this programming mode and so if we switch the RAM over to programming mode then we're not using whatever is in the actual memory address register but we're rather we're using these dip switches um, to control the address that we're interested in. In programming mode we're always accessing programming memory and then we can select a particular value which we'd like to write into there uh, using these dip switches. And it actually gets written uh, using a clock pulse. So to program, you have to switch the computer to manual mode and then switch it to programming mode and then use this button to pulse in the values which you set on these dip switches. And so the typical use for that is to enter a program such as this one uh, into program memory. And uh, we had a look at how that was implemented. So using a standard uh, 74 HCT 377 register here, and then using some selectors to be able to switch between selecting either the register contents or these dip switch uh, values based on whether we're in programming mode or not. And we have a similar setup for the RAM chip. So we also have two selectors here, which allow us to select either bus contents or the contents of these dip switches. And then we have these two buffers, one in each direction. So one of them uh, is allowing values which we read from ROM to go out straight onto the bus. That's all of these blue wires. And then we have another one here, which is only ever active on a very small edge detecting pulse, uh, which happens when we want to write to RAM. And in that case, the contents of either the bus or these dip switches, depending on the setting of that program switch, uh, will be fed into the RAM. And um, so for the next episode, we'll uh, have a look at the program counter, which is this register down here. And uh, its function is basically to either increment by one regularly or to uh, jump around based on the instructions in the program. And so we'll have a look at how that's implemented. And we'll probably also have a look at the instruction register itself, uh, which on my computer is, it turns out to be pretty simple due to the fact that I'm using eight bits of actual instruction. So, see you in the next video.